everyone. I just wanted to talk about gender bias today. And what is gender bias? Gender bias in the most basic form of definition is just discrimination, right? Discriminating someone on the basis of gender. So something about me, I'm Indu. I'm Indu Alagar Sami. I'm a developer. I've been developing for the past 15, 15 years. I've been programming for the past 15 years. I now work with a company called Particular Software. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about me and how I got into tech. So I'm originally from India. And my school, this was in eighth grade, and my school came up with this computer science center. And that was like the first time the room was so cool and pristine. It was something like, you know, had these really cool machines and it was, it was awesome. So had a little peek in there and it was great. And I had a, a little chat with one of the teachers and she encouraged me. She said, hey, you should sign up. And it was summer, summertime and I inquired all the, the prices for the programming classes and it was... Uh, it was about, I think, 300 rupees, which is back in the day, a lot of money <laughs> uh, coming from a middle, middle class background. So I had this conversation with my brother. I said, hey, um, I really want to do this, and, but I think it's expensive, so I'm not going to do this. My brother said, are you crazy? I mean, you should have this conversation with dad. I'm sure dad would just, you know, take care of it. What is difficult for you? You know, he, he will make, find a way. So you just need to talk to him. And that was the most important conversation in my life because that changed the way for me. Because I had that conversation and my brother was very supportive. He felt like I could do this. And I had that talk with my dad. My dad said, of course. And my family has been there for me, very, very supportive. My grandfather, he, he was a freedom fighter, and he was, he was uh, an active participant in the freedom struggle for India. And one of the things was, he, like, our bedtime stories would be like how these people like, fought for freedom and how you know, courageous they were. And especially, like, he would like, talk to us about women who took part in the freedom struggle and how these courageous like queens just fought against the British and, and it, was, it was amazing. And this used to be bedtime stories growing up. And my grandmother, she was an amazing woman. She took care of five girls, five daughters. And when my grandfather was imprisoned, she had to raise them for two years. And of course, the village, the community helped her with it. But just to be there as a woman and to raise five daughters all by herself through the time of turmoil, that takes courage. And my mom, she's always believed in me. So I grew up with this sort of great family, you know, around me, supporting me, telling me that I could do whatever I want. And my dad, he, he is the most incorrigible optimist in this entire universe. If I went to him and I said like, hey dad, I wanna do this, be like, sure, you can do this. You know, so I had the support system. But outside of these walls, it was a very different society. Like when I stepped out of these walls, it was, you know, questions about like, hey, during like college or, you know, like, you're just a woman. You're going to get married and have kids. Why are you even trying to do this? You know, this could be someone else's, you know, chance to get into engineering. You are just getting into engineering and you are preventing someone else from getting in. Yes, I'm a woman. I'm a mom. I have two great kids, but I can be a programmer too. I can change the world. I got into programming because I wanted to solve problems. So I had this conversation or thought process going on in my head. I'm like, I want to do more. You know, I want to, I want to raise awareness in tech for women and who ask or question themselves, 
like, hey, is this a good field? This is a, is this a good you know, place to get in? It is. If you're into solving problems, this is fantastic. Heck, you can make a lot of money doing this. You can enjoy, have fun, make money. What's not to like about this, right? So that's why I want to I wanna stand up here. Like Mary said, right, you have to stand up for yourself. When you stand up for yourself and speak against something that's not right, you speak for everyone that's going through your pain. Okay, so toys and girls, like how toys are marketed for girls versus how toys are marketed for boys, that starts at a very, very young age, right? If you go into Walmart, Target, there's an aisle full of stuff for girls and all the robotics and the cool toys, like techie or nerdy toys, are there for boys. So right at a very young age, we start segregating, like, hey, this is what girls do, and this is what boys do, right? So it starts young. And uh, Debbie Sterling, the founder of GoldieBlocks.com, she was a woman in tech, and she had trouble in, in, you know, as a woman in tech, and she started this company just to change it. And her characters in GoldieBlocks are girls, and, and it, the, the toys help like build something that's interesting for the girls, and it's fantastic. And I asked my little girl, and who does not like princesses, and I would be in very big trouble. She's back there smiling at me. Uh, but, but, you know, I asked her, hey, who is your favorite Marvel character? And at first, you know, this is back in the day when Avengers 1 came out, and it was um, Black Widow. She was awesome. She was fantastic, right? And then later on, like, I don't know, a couple of days ago, I asked her, hey, who's your favorite Marvel character? I said, Iron Man. Like, what? You changed on me. You, you said Black Widow was, and, and now it's Iron Man? And, and, and the reason she gave me was, Mom, Black Widow doesn't do that much. I mean, she was there, but now she's gone. You know, I see more of Iron Man. So... You know, that's a very important thing. Screen time. If you look at, in the past decade, this is from New York Film Institute, uh, the stats. If you look in the past decade of inspiring female roles in, in leading movies, you can count them with your fingers of, as to how many were women, are women, right? It's not a lot. And then I had this conversation with my son. Like, hey, are we missing anybody here? Like, Tris' mom from Divergent, like, okay, Tris, let's add her. Anybody else, right? But we're, like, hard to come up with names. Yep, we got the girl on fire, but, right, there, there isn't a lot. But if we reverse that question and ask, like, you know, hey, how many, you know, awesome, cool characters, like, like Mission Impossible, mom, right? This, the, the list is just endless. You just keep going. That's the number, 12%. That's the number of women in leading roles. And then, if you dwindle it down by race, if you narrow it down to women of color, that just number goes down even smaller, 1%. So... Here we are trying to see like, how we want more women in tech. How do we get more women involved? And yet, you know, over time, we're setting these precedents. There's not enough role models. There's, there's, there's even toys that are different, that speak differently. There's like years and years and years and years of stuff of how things are targeted for girls, right? Taking it to tech, these days, you can't even appear on like a recruiting ad for your own company. Being a, a, a full stack engineer for your own company, you can't be on an ad without receiving like sexist remarks. I think the whole Twitter went wild with this, right? The whole I look like an engineer. It's important for, for kids, to, for other women that are aspiring to get into tech to know that, hey, tech is... 
Tech is wonderful. There are a lot of women out there doing fantastic things, right? So again, one of the programmer talks, we had a similar number, right? 5.8%. Out of 20,000 people that Stack Overflow surveyed uh, in, in a survey, right? 5.8% are women. 26,000 people, and we've got 5.8%. That's a very, 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 very small number when you're talking about women in tech. And this surveys like from people from all over the world, from about 150, 60 countries. And if you look at the, the women in tech stats for like these three important companies, it's not a lot. Google's got 18%, Microsoft is somewhere 16%, Apple's got 22%. Now, this is the women, the stats for women in tech. Now, if you add race to this, it's not very, it, it becomes even bad. There's not a lot. 1% is black for, in Google, 2% Hispanic. And this 1% and 2%, this is not the, just the women. This is the total. So now if you add women in tech down by, you know, even further by the gender, it is like really, really bad, right? And again, these stats are available. These are, these are not old stats. These are 2015 stats that the companies have released. So the numbers are not very, very great. So how, how can we, and then, and then if you look at the, the bias. Now, this was a, a survey done by University of California by the Hastings study. And they found that every single woman of color faced some sort of bias against them, 100% of women. And the women that were of other races, it was like 90 plus percent. So it's not like, you know, it's not very less either. It's about 90%. So again, how do we, why are we here, right? It's because our brains are so wired from all these years and years and years of things that we have seen and things that our brains have like learned. You've seen so many uh, ads that talk about women and you know, that portray women in a certain way. It just is built for heaven's sake, right? Eve tempted Adam. I mean, let's begin from there. It's all Eve's fault, right? So, I mean, that thing has been built on from forever. So what does our brain do? We may not all be like openly biased. We, we may think that we're not biased. We may think that, hey, we are really awesome, open people. And however, our brains have made these shortcuts based on all of the information that has collected through society, through what we learn, through our parents, through our grandparents. Everything is wired in our brain. So Harvard University came up with this. It's called the Implicit Association Test. And it has two types of tests. One is for race and one is for gender. And I promise you, you will be surprised when you take, the, when you take that test. It is um, because you, like the test goes like this. You have to press a certain key. Like they, they flash certain groups, like, you know, family, then who do you associate with, a woman or man, like names. So it's like really quick associations to, to gauge like your bias level. Then you find out that like you may be biased after all. And it is not like, you know, it is a problem, but knowing that there is a problem is much better than not knowing, right? So if you know that you are biased, you can take actions, right? If you believe that you are biased, you can take some action. You can take some good actions. You can look forward and you can, when, whenever your brain wants to take that quick shortcut, you might want to like slow down for a second and say, hey, wait, I was going to do this, but you know, that, that little pause right there, that might take you in a different path to help you make a better, different decision than the one that you probably were going to do before. 
So some things like for women, like, you know, what I've noticed is sometimes we don't own our credit. Like when somebody else like tells like, hey, you did a great job. You know, sometimes say, ah, don't worry. I mean, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. You put a lot of research into this, right? So it is okay to say, thank you. I appreciate that. Rather than saying like, oh, don't worry. It was nothing. Don't undermine your own work because how you portray yourself also matters. And the other thing is saying sorry. I am horrible at this. I, I apologize for things I probably shouldn't even be apologizing. I do this all the time. And then my colleagues are awesome about this, saying, dude, stop apologizing. Right. So, so this is something that like, I tell myself, like, hey, you know, should I even be apologizing about this? It's, is it, it's not even my fault. It's just the word just comes out like, sorry, like begin my sentence with sorry. You know, I need to tell myself, like, stop doing that. Right. And then the other thing is raising concerns. If you, you know, are in a situation where you feel like things are said harmlessly right at workplace, uh, the person may not even be aware that, you know, that's the point of the whole unconscious bias. The person that just said it may not even like, you know, realize that they've offended you. But the fact that you have been offended means something. There is something more there. So it is very, very important you give that person the right feedback because that can help change the way. Of course, there are the, the sexists and the misogynists, but, you know, Hopefully, we don't work with a lot of them, right? And, and the people that we work with, we like, I like to believe that I work in a company where we're all equals. We're all human beings. We all have emotions, right? So I should be able to walk up to you and say, hey, you told me this. Yeah, I take it. It's a joke. But, you know, it's not really nice for X, Y, and Z reason." Right. So having that conversation, I think, is important. Giving that feedback, I think, is important. Of course, unconsciously, a lot of us do this, which is it starts with hiring practice. When we hire, companies say, hey, we want more diversity. We want more women. I can't find women in tech. But first of all, are you even looking in the right place? Right. So there are a lot of places that may not be the normal mainstream places that you go when you recruit people. But if you want diversity, you have an obligation and to look in all the places that you normally wouldn't look and get some help, do some research, right? Find more sources where you can advertise the fact that you're hiring. That is important. And uh, the other thing is, like, when resumes are submitted, there was, a, there was a study. When a resume was submitted, it was the same exact resume, but the only thing that was changed was the name on the resume, but yielded completely entirely res different results. The set that reviewed it with the, with the guy's name on it felt like, hey, this person's confident. And he, I think, you know, he's good. Now, the same people that looked at the resume with the woman's name felt that, hey, I, I don't know, not very sure. It's the same exact resume, which yielded, you know, different results. So, you know, maybe there are some things to, to do there. If that's the case, to dig down deep, does it even matter to have the name on the resume if, if you're doing some sort of, like, uh, filtering? Does, does the name matter, right? The, the other thing is interruptions. I hate this. When I'm talking in a meeting or when I'm collaborating with others in a meeting, I mean, I think this is where men are slightly different from women. Like men interrupt each other all day long and they're like, nothing's happening there. But when I get interrupted, when I'm trying to say something for the past five minutes and I can't say it, or finally, I'm trying to say it, and then somebody just talks over me. That makes me mad. And then I lose my train of thought. And then 
I lose whatever it is that was valuable that I was trying to contribute. So this is where interruptions are bad, but it is not one person's responsibility to speak up, right? If you're in a culture, if you're in a meeting where someone interrupted somebody else, anyone can speak up, right? Say, hey, can you let this other person, person finish? Can, you know, that extra, extra voice from another person may be all that needs. And, and the other thing is uh, reviews. This is where, like, depending on race, it gets interesting. You get um, labeled as angry or, like, you know, whatever, like, um, th this, like, when, when there was results or when th there was a study done on performance reviews between men and women, the kind of comments that men receive versus the kind of comments that women receive, that was, like, like women were, like, hey, you're being emotional. Like, do you give out that you are emotional card to a dude in your company? If not, like, when you are giving feedback to another person, just stop and think. Is this the same type of feedback that you give? Because this sort of feedback could not just be in performance reviews, but it could be like, you know, on Slack when you're collaborating. Let's say someone just said some, you know, some stuff that's relevant. Maybe they were passionate about it. But when you get a response saying like, hey, you seemed angry, that just totally killed all my credibility, right? It took away all the things that I was trying to point out and instead focused on an emotion I wasn't even like trying to convey. So by saying I was angry, you just discredited all of the things that I was trying to highlight on why a certain thing is a good thing or a bad thing. So um, be cautious when giving out comments like that because they have an impact because you don't want to reduce the person's impact when they're contributing, be it you know, company meetings or, or whatever, a feature discussion or whatever it is. Lastly, office housework. This is sometimes like women get like naturally delegated into these roles because they're good at it, because they take notes during meetings. And you can always ask like, hey, do you, do, do you have the meeting notes for you know, XYZ meeting? I'd be like, yep, sure, because I love to write down things and I have a notebook and I always write down things. So it's like, it's easy for me to say, yep, here, you know, let me write, write down something, here you go. But this shouldn't be one person's responsibility. This should be whoever is organizing the meeting. It should be everybody that participated in that meeting to know and realize that, hey, you know, let's all send in some quick comments. Could be on a GitHub issue, right? So just being aware and not like bucketing one person as this person to go and, you know, uh, go do meeting notes. So diversity we know leads to many good things, right? Different thoughts, different perspectives. If you are dealing with a product for women, having women in there gives you like the kind of things that you probably wouldn't have thought about. Uh, you know, how, however it is, whatever feature you're marketing. But in general, like having a diverse work group, you know, causes, promotes more creativity. You want that. And finally, discrimination is just plain wrong. Nobody should have to get discriminated because of race or gender or whatever, right? And if you see something that is wrong, you have to stand up and speak up. It is your right. And it is never a bad time to, to correct something right. It is never a bad time. It's always right to do, to do you know, what is right. It, the time doesn't matter. So finally, like, have this conversation with your companies. Policies don't change people. Policies just don't. Policy is on paper. Companies can have a gender bias, you know, forced meeting, like everybody, you guys need to attend the gender bias meeting. That's not going to change things. People change people, right? Conversations change people. So it's important to have conversations. And, you know, it's important to start a discussion. Like, hey, um, here are some common things 
that I'm finding difficult. Let's have a conversation. Let's see how to fix that. Let's just take it from there. And you know that would lead to better results in coming up with the right policy. And then in coming up with educating something else. So it's not one person's responsibility to speak up. We as a community speak up. Whoever is working in the organization, together the team speaks up, right? The team looks out for each other. And I think it's important to do that because we have daughters, sisters, mothers, right, that may need this. So thank you. <laughs>